I'm Joe Ryan. I'm one of the faculty here, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gary Bader from the University of Toronto. He is a professor of computational biology at the Terence Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research. Um, he got his bachelor's degree from McGill University in Montreal in biochemistry and his PhD at University of Toronto, where he developed a um, biomolecular interaction database called BIND. And this was in the late 90s before this, anything like this existed. And uh, it, be, was a, it was a big deal and it um, was used by many people, still used today by a lot of people. And, uh, and that database is, um, kind of propelled his career into working with a lot of large-scale projects like the mapping the human proteome and mapping the yeast interaction database, um, you know, working with scientists from all over the world, and now he heads up the, uh, not heads up, but he's one of the uh, organizing members of the Human Cell Atlas, which you'll hear about today. Um, and. Um, he also is, develops a lots of software packages that are used by scientists all over the world. And so just to uh, give you a little bit of perspective, he's published about 200 papers that have been uh, and 15 book chapters that have been cited uh, more than 50,000 times. So it's, um, we're really lucky to have Gary here. So please um, join me in welcoming him to the... Oh, thank you very much for the great introduction, Joe, and it's a pleasure to be here, not just because I was shoveling snow in my driveway in Toronto this morning, but um, also because it's enjoyable and, and um, I'm happy to come here and talk. Um, how many Canadians? I, I heard some, okay, I heard some people shout when they heard Toronto, but okay. Um, okay, so, um, I, and I apologize in advance, some of the slides might be a little bit squished, but um, it's hopefully uh, all good. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys, uh, to everybody here today about um, a project called the Human Cell Atlas. Uh, the goal is to map all the cells in the human body, and there's a lot of cells. So how are we going to do this? Um, so first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about history and then give you some introduction about what cells are and what they do and how they're related to um, uh, how the body works and um, how it doesn't work if it fails in disease. And then I'm going to tell you about the actual project um, and, 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 and some specific stories related to it. Um, OK, so the history I wanted to talk to you about is about the microscope. So everybody knows about the microscope. Um, it was uh, um, uh, invented, the modern version was invented in, the, in 1609 by Galileo. And people had known for even hundreds of years that round balls of glass or even water droplets can magnify or change um, uh, uh, an image. Um, so you could use that principle, um, but Galileo figured out how to put it together into something like a useful tool. And then uh, Antony van Leeuwenhoek uh, from the Netherlands uh, figured out how to make lenses really, uh, he sort of really advanced the art of making lenses and as a result was able to magnify um, objects much more than people previously could. And he got his lenses um, up to a magnification of 275 times. And so as soon, and this happened around 1668, and as soon as he started doing that, he was looking at all sorts of things under the microscope. Supposedly he was a tailor, so he started off with cloth and he was looking at all sorts of natural materials. Um, and then he started looking at other things like, you know, water from the pond and uh, soil that he collected from, from his backyard. Um, and um, he, he also started looking at plants and, and parts of the human body. And he was able to, uh, he was credited as being the first person to see cells. Um, and he found red blood cells, bacteria, microscopic animals, um, and uh, which he called animalcules. And I, I, when I read about this, I just imagine what he must have been thinking in 1674 to look through a glass and see things moving around and wondering, wow, this is like a, a whole new world. What is this? Like tiny little animals that nobody ever saw before. We don't even have names for them. Blood cells that are coursing through our veins. So 
I, I just imagine how much his world must have been changed by that, that discovery. Um, and, uh, um, and, and then you know, other people like um, Hook published a really interesting book called Micrographia that uh, captured a lot of the images that people were looking at in microscopes. This is an example of a cork plant, um, and this is the first time I understand that um, someone looked at this, uh, these little um, uh, structures here and called them cells. So he thought it looked like a honeycomb, um, and they, you know, so he used the word cell, um, which was the same word that people use for the cells of a, of a, of a, of a honeycomb. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's where the, the word cell came from. So um, here's a, a picture of an onion um, skin that I took off the internet. So this is sort of a typical high school um, project where you peel an onion skin very thinly and then you can look under the microscope and you might stain it so that you can see the structures more clearly. Um, and you can see these plant cells here with different parts, uh, the, nucle the uh, nucleus and the cell wall. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. So um, once people started looking at objects around them and, and different types of organisms for actually hundreds of years, it took them uh, to, to, to build up a theory of what they were looking at. And eventually, um, uh, these people were credited with, discover with creating the cell theory. So the first two, two rules that they came up with in 1839 were that all living organisms are composed of one or more cells. And the cell is the basic unit and structure of, of organization in, in all organisms, which is pretty amazing. So that basically came because they were looking at lots and lots of different organisms, animals, plants, everything, bacteria, and everything had cells. So that's also uh, kind of interesting to think about how they m eventually made that connection to realize that all living organisms, living uh, matter, is made up of cells. Um, and then later they added another rule cell, that cells arise from pre-existing cells because they could figure out that cells would divide. And so actually all the cells that we have on Earth eventually came from early cells, right? So they all came from, from uh, um, original ancient cells. Um, and this, eventually, this led to the golden age of cell discovery. So people started naming cells and identifying all sorts of different types of cells and cataloging them. And in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, people also discovered that the cells contain chromosomes, and then they started thinking about genetics and actually veered off a lot more towards thinking about genetics and eventually molecular biology. And most of the cells that were discovered uh, and have, have names, like for instance, Theodore Schwann, one of the cells in the brain is called a Schwann cell. Um, they're named after a lot of these people. But that was sort of the golden age. Since then, people have discovered cells here and there, but mostly um, have not been focusing on that. So, um, but we do know from, from this early work that cells are the basic units of our bodies as well. And uh, there's lots of different types. They have all sorts of different shapes and functions. Um, they can be organized, so we can have different types of skin cells and immune cells, brain cells, muscle cells, and um, uh, that we can classify them by structure, location, the function in the body, which you know part of the body they're from, and um, the molecules that they uh, express that allow them to function in a particular way, like the cells in your eye express molecules that allow you to convert light into electrical signals that you can process into vision, uh, for instance. Um, and we also know from that original cell theory hundreds of years ago that cells come from an initial cell. So we know that, and we all know that uh, the human body is created from a single stem cell, a single egg and, 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 uh, and sperm that create a single cell and then divide and keep dividing and eventually make all of the cells in our body. Um, so all the cells in our body have the same initial uh, information um, that is uh, present in them, the, the genome, the information, uh, the genetic, our genetic information. But um, so we can think, you know, every cell in your body is the same um, because it all has, every cell has a copy of the genome, um, the genetic information. But it's, it's not actually the same because the cells are functioning different, differently and they, they look different, they have different shapes. So how does this, um, you know, how is each cell different even though they all have the same set of instructions? So uh, for a long time people have studied this and the general idea that many people here likely know uh, that's sort of part of the foundation of genetics and biology is that 
DNA uh, contains information that helps, uh, a lot, this basically specifies these protein machines that help run the cell. So um, DNA is you know, the information and the protein is the function. And this process is called gene expression. So um, in, when you look at different cells, uh, one of the things that makes them different is that they turn on and off different genes um, in this gene expression process. So if you have four genes, A, B, C, D, um, you, can fi you might find, you might imagine that this cell um, expresses two copies of gene A and one copy of gene C, and you can kind of represent it using this little color uh, plot here where the, um, the, the, the darker the color, the more... Um, the more copies of the gene are expressed. And here's another example where uh, the cell expresses one copy each of genes A, B, and C. And you can represent it like this. And here's another copy, another cell which is expressing two copies of gene B and two copies of gene D. And you can express it like this. So you can see that the cells, even though they have the same information, and they're, that's where all this, these things are coming from. They're all coming from the genome, but they turn on different levels and different combinations of these genes, and, and you can see they're different. And then that actually relates eventually to their, their, their different function. So um, the gene expression profile, these, these you know, uh, little plots here, is like the calling card of a, of a cell or the signature or identity of a cell. You could imagine that it's not the only part, uh, the only way we can describe a cell, but it, it definitely is a component of, an important component of why cells are different. Um, I also mentioned proteins, so it's not just the, the, the information about the, the transcripts here that are used to create proteins um, that's different. It's the proteins themselves and lots of other molecules that, that exist that are different. Um, so um, um, now, how, does this, um, how is this interesting for us uh, in, in general? Um, well, one thing that we know of, we know is that um, a lot of cell functions are related to disease. So cells, all cells are meant to carry out or evolve to carry out some specific function, like the retina cells in your eye or muscle cells, which allow you to move. Um, and frequently, diseases that we know about, especially genetic diseases, um, affect uh, these functions. And frequently, those affect an individual cell type. So for instance, um, neurons uh, can be affected to cause autism. Muscle can be affected to cause muscular dystrophy, um, uh, and, and you know, fat cells are uh, important for obesity. Uh, dendritic cells in the um, gut are in the intestine are uh, important for Crohn's disease. So, um, you know, it's important for us to understand how these cells work and how they work in our body for us to understand how um, how uh, these mutations end up causing these diseases. So the, that's great. We can talk about cells, but um, how do we map all the cells in our, our you know, how do we um, you know, think about our body? And one number that comes up, um, and this number, there's different versions of this number, but one commonly quoted number is that our body has on average 37.2 trillion cells. I don't know where they came with, up with the 0.2, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's somewhere between 30, 30 trillion and 100 trillion. And sometimes you, you look at how people, th these are all estimates, of course, you can't actually count 30, 37 trillion cells in your body, but um, people estimate it. And the higher numbers, interestingly, include microorganisms like bacteria that are in our gut. And there's a huge number of microorganisms that are living in our body and are symbiotic with our body. And, um, and so if you count them, you actually get many more trillions of cells. And maybe those should be counted as part of our body, but they're not the same, they don't, they don't have our, our genome. They're different organisms. So textbooks say that there's about 300 major cell types. Um, science says there's, if, if people have looked at individual set types of cells, like neurons, and they've studied them for a long time, they realize that there are many, many more subtypes, even hundreds of subtypes uh, for um, um, just in, in the retina or different parts of the brain. So um, the textbook describes the major cells that um, we've heard about like muscle cells and uh, retina cells, rod cells and cone cells in the eye, for instance. But we know that it's likely a really a big underestimate of how many cells there are. So um, what we'd like to have is a map of how all these cells uh, uh, are related to each other and how many cells there are and 
um, in, in terms of types and what types of uh, actions they can have, their states that they can be in. Um, and one way of thinking about, uh, about this um, is going back to that gene expression where um, I showed you the little, uh, little um, uh, boxes of uh, uh, little diagrams that had different colored squares representing how, which genes were on and how much they were on. So you can imagine um, extending that. Uh, I showed you four genes, but the human body has over 20,000 protein coding genes. And so you can imagine those strips are very long, 20,000 long. Um, and um, you can think of a cell as being kind of a point in space that has 20,000 dimensions, and you can relate cells based on how close they are in the space. So cells that have similar patterns across those 20,000 genes are probably the same cell type, or if they have the same pattern, they're probably the same cell type. If they have similar patterns, they're probably the similar cell type. And if they're very different patterns of those, you know, those uh, plots, then they're probably different cell types. So just keep that in mind. That's, that's one of the um, kind of ideas behind how we might map cells in one particular way using this gene expression idea. Um, did I kill this thing when I dropped it? Or I messed up my computer. Excuse me. My computer did not like when I dropped part of it. Okay, this is... Hmm, okay, I'm gonna have to do some surgery here. Yeah, the, the apples never fail, but this one. It's the first time this has ever happened. Okay. I'm a trained computer scientist, so hopefully I can, should be able to do that. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, apologies. Uh, okay, so a cell is, um, you know, we can think of how similar it is to other cells in, in this way. Um, and, um, but how do we figure out, how do we measure those genes in, in cells? So cells are really small, um, and, um, you know, we need some way of measuring that. So, there's a recent technological advance called single cell genomics, and there's also a kind of a spatial version of it. Um, the general idea, uh, for, for many years, um, we've been able to measure gene expression data, even since 1999 or 1998 even, um, using various different technologies. But those technologies have all relied on taking a, 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 a tissue and taking a, a pretty big sample, like a chunk of um, a, a particular tissue, like part of a piece of skin, for instance, and then you, you actually um, put all of it together into the um, experimental method to measure gene, the gene expression, and so you get an, an, an average gene expression over all the genes and all the cells, and we didn't know how, how to um, think about that before, but now um, what we realize is that that's kind of like, if, you, if each cell is a fruit, um, the genomics that we used to have uh, the technology that we used to have that allowed us to measure these gene expression changes is kind of like a smoothie. Take all the fruit and blend it up. Um, now what we can do with single cell genomics is measure all the fruit. So imagine you had a smoothie and you wanted to know what fruit went into it. That's kind of like, it would be pretty hard. You could sort of guess and taste, um, but to, to know exactly which, what the recipe is, um, that might be, might be challenging, especially if there are 20,000 fruits. Uh, and um, with single cell genomics, we can just measure that right out of the, the, um, the sample. Um, there's also an interesting aspect of spatial genomics, which I won't really talk about very much, where we can not only measure how many, um, you know, the gene expression level for all the different cells, but we can also identify where they are, how they're spatially organized in a, in a tissue. 
Okay, so um, this techno I'll, I'll tell you how this, this um, technology works um, in a, a little bit of detail. Um, so first of all, we have a tissue sample. Um, and uh, the first challenge that we have is to get the cells out of the tissue. So normally, um, in a tissue like, for instance, the skin, the cells don't want to come out of there because that would be bad, right? You don't want your cells, your skin falling apart. So the cells are really holding onto each other really strongly and they've built a kind of nest or a house for themselves by secreting all sorts of proteins and, um, that keep them together and actually are part of the function of the tissue. So our skin is really good at um, blocking things from the outside to, to come into our bodies. And um, so if you wanted to take all the cells out, you kind of have to come up with some way of doing it. So I'm, I'll, I'll show you one example later of exactly how that works. Um, and once you have these cells, then you can isolate them, uh, and then you can measure the gene expression, uh, of the expression of all the genes from this individual cell, and you can um, sequence these um, RNA messages uh, that um, are encoded in the genome and give rise to proteins. And um, when you have a list of a lot of these, it's called the transcriptome, because these are called transcripts, and the transcriptome is the set of all the transcripts in a, in a, in a cell. Um, and this um, sequencing is done with DNA sequencing technology that's quite standard now and much more cost effective than it used to be. Okay, so the way that the, the, the current version of this technology works, there's a company called 10X Genomics um, uh, that has popularized, uh, commercialized this, this type of technology. So um, this it uses a technology called microfluidic droplet-based um, technology. So what happens is you put cells in, so this, this is a little microfluidic device with little channels, little tubes, and you can send cells in one tube or two tubes, and then you can, um, uh, they're, they're sent in um, a, uh, um, uh, through uh, either oil or, or aqueous solution, so they, oil and water don't mix. So um, then you also have these, little microparticles that are the measurement devices. So what you are trying to do is you're trying to capture a measurement device and a cell in the same water droplet bubble in oil. And this is pretty small, but you can sort of see that there's a little uh, droplet here and there's a little cell that goes along with it. So the droplet's bigger than the cell. So think of the, the drop, this, uh, sorry, this microparticle as um, the measurement device. The, this is the droplet and it's captured with a little cell. So once it goes into that droplet, there's um, chemicals that are put in to um, uh, basically uh, open up the cell and free all of the mRNA molecules, the transcripts that are in there. Um, and then those can bind to these microparticles, which are covered in probes. So these are pre-designed. They're covered in DNA probes that can recognize the transcripts for different, different uh, genes. And, um, and they um, capture as many of these transcripts as they can, uh, and then they keep them with them in the, in the droplet um, as it goes through. So um, once you've finished collecting as many cells as you can and putting them together with a measurement device in this little droplet, these tiny little droplets, and then doing that thousands of times, then you can um, uh, um, amplify this signal. So this is a standard technique in molecular biology uh, PCR, um, for instance, so um, you can, um, it's, it's well, uh, well understood that you can amplify um, RNA molecules or DNA molecules, uh, and um, the, uh, the interesting thing here, which is one of the breakthroughs of this technology, is that normally when you do this amplification, you kind of lose track of how much of the original molecule is there, because different molecules might amplify at different rates and there's a, it's a bit noisy. So um, if you just did this on a bunch of molecules and you amplified them up, you'd be able to detect them, which is what we used to be able to do. But we want to figure out exactly how many of them were in each cell. Um, so there are specific DNA barcodes um, that you can use to keep track of all of this stuff that people engineered. Um, so one is um, a... Uh, um, a barcode that's the same for all the probes on 
this microparticle. So that is an address or a zip code for the microparticle. So if you have thousands of microparticles, measurement devices, each one has its own zip code. And then each probe has a unique molecular identifier zip code as well. So each probe has its own zip code. So if you capture one of these transcripts on a probe and you start amplifying it, that unique molecular identifier gets amplified. And you can know that no matter how many copies you've read out, it all came from one original molecule. And so you can say, I counted that molecule once, even though you have a very amplified signal. Um, and uh, so the, all, because these, these, all these barcodes exist, these zip codes, you can mix them all together and put them in the DNA sequencer and read out lots and lots of information. And then because you know what the barcodes are, you can go back and figure and, and sort of split it all up, deconvolute it so that you can figure out which information from the DNA sequencing uh, experiment came from which microparticle and from which probe. And then you can reconstruct which cells expressed which molecules of, of transcripts. So that's it. this in the past, since about 2015 when this idea was invented, that's really changed the game in how we can do these measurements. Um, so, um, so going back to the microscope, the way I like to think about this is that this technology is like a new kind of microscope. So with the microscope, we could see cells and we can understand their shape and we can look at how they move. Uh, we can look at the structures within a cell. Um, but now with this new technology, the single cell genomics technology, we can understand uh, a lot more. We don't see what the shape is anymore, but we see a lot of how the cell is functioning. So all the genes, all those, those genes uh, um, combinations that are expressed, um, and we know a lot about genes. So once we read out the genes that are expressed within a cell, we can find out what functions those genes are known to have, and we can I identify what systems in the body those are part of, like what, what biological pathways or, or systems they, they're, they're involved in. Um, so for instance, some genes can be involved in metabolism, um, energy production, that kind of thing. Uh, and so if we, if we now can measure all these genes, we can look at the cell and we can say, oh, this cell is, has a really high energy production. Maybe it's always working. It's one of the, the, the big factory cells, for instance, um, just as an example. Okay, so single cell genomics data is growing exponentially right now. So um, uh, this is, these are numbers from the Broad Institute in Boston, um, from the, what they call the Klarman Cell Observatory. So they decided to take this uh, idea from astronomy where we have telescopes and we have these observatories to measure, uh, to, to measure as much information we can from the heavens or the stars. Um, and um, they wanted to do the same thing with cells. Uh, so um, they now, you know, this, this number is growing exponentially. They, they've measured millions and millions of, of cells in this, in this system. Um, so we, we now can um, identify lots more information. For instance, we can discover cell types that we didn't know existed. The last time this mostly happened was in the 1800s when people really, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, spending a lot of time discovering new cells and describing them, and now we can go back and figure out all these extra cells that they missed. Um, and we can also understand how they're related to each other. So this is a plot of um, how cells are related through development from a fertilized egg uh, through to more mature cells. Um, we can identify uh, the programs that they're using. So each of these dots represents a cell in this space, and they're put together in a, um, such that similar cells cells that have similar gene expression uh, profiles are put together. And, um, and, and I, I mentioned that we can learn a lot about the function of these cells. OK, so just some examples. Um, I'll, I'll really only talk about uh, one example from this slide. Um, the most fun paper uh, that, I, that, that opened my eyes to the um, power of this technology was when people started looking at the lung. And um, they mapped out a lot of different cells in the lung, and they found a new cell. And they call it, it's an ionocyte. So they, we knew something about these ionocyte cells, but people didn't really know that they were in the lung very much, and they didn't know a lot about them and how they were um, structured in the lung. Um, but the interesting thing, so that's nice. We found a new cell type. That's, that's great. But the interesting thing is that these ionocytes were the only cells in the lung to express the cystic fibrosis gene. 
Um, this gene is the first gene that was pretty much understood as a genetic disease. Um, it's really well studied. Uh, CFTR um, is the gene name. And um, you know, we know a lot about this gene. But it turns out that we, you know, even though we know it's expressed in the lung and the airways, um, it turns out we, we didn't even know what cell it was part of. And not only that, we didn't know what that cell was. So this one experiment discovered a new cell and found that this very well-known disease gene is only in that cell. So that was you know, very interesting for me because it's a single experiment and it's two major discoveries, I think. Um, so another one that I just read uh, that was published in January in Nature Medicine and, uh, just a, a month ago or less um, was very interesting because uh, some researchers from the NIH uh, used this technology on a patient. So somebody came in um, to the hospital and they had a, 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 um, a um, they had a uh, disease called drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. I've never heard of this syndrome before, but according to the paper, it's a potentially fatal, fatal in inflammatory disease. It affects many organs. Um, they don't know a lot about it, but they, they, have some, they have some idea that it's related to viral infection. Um, but there are limited treatment options if the first um, drugs don't work. Um, so what they did was they took, uh, and, and it, it affects the skin as well, so they took um, skin and blood sample from the patient with this disease that they couldn't treat anymore. Um, they measured, they used the single cell genomics microscope, uh, and they found that um, the gene, the cells, um, there were a whole bunch of cells that were in this patient that were not in normal skin. And those cells, um, particular type of C T cells, were expressing a particular signaling pathway that actually has a known drug target. It's, it's known, it's, it's well known, and uh, there are drugs that uh, inhibit it. So this one drug, for instance, they were able to take and, um, and give it to the patient, and it actually eventually cleared up his disease. So it represented um, a brand new treatment for this disease. Um, so they, in, again, in one experiment, they discovered all the mechanism for the, for the, or a lot of the mechanism, uh, new mechanism for how this disease is working, and enough to actually figure out what medic medicine to give the patient, and, and it worked. So that was really cool. Um, so having a map is incredibly useful. I think I've convinced you that um, not only is it interesting for biologists to understand all the cell types and, and how they work, but it's also very important medically, and there's a lot of other possible applications outside of medicine and other organisms. Um, so let's make an atlas of all the human cells. So the Human Cell Atlas uh, project is a, a large international scientific project um, whose goal is to create a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells um, and uh, um, to, to help with all of the things that I, that I mentioned. So um, the ultimate goal is that we may you know, one analogy to chemistry is that maybe we could eventually have a periodic table of the cells. A nice thing about the periodic table from chemistry is it's, you know, you have, uh, it's pretty complete, so you can really understand the structure and how everything's related to each other. Yes, occasionally we discover new, new uh, elements, but all the elements that are on there are really well understood. So we, if we could uh, do that with cells, that would be very beneficial to get a complete list and, and organizing. Uh, organization of them. Um, we also know that um, humans are very diverse, and uh, so are their cells. So it's, you can't just have one group do this. Uh, it's a very big problem. Not only is there 37 trillion cells in one person, but there's billions of people on, on Earth, and there's probably a lot of differences between many of these people at the cell level and how their, their cells work. Um, and so many people should participate in this project. So. The, the Human Cell Atlas was uh, born a few years ago um, and is now a rapidly growing global uh, and open scientific initiative um, involving 70 countries and uh, almost 1,700 uh, scientists have signed up um, with over 1,000 institutes. And actually, anybody can sign up. You can go to the website and do Join HCA, and you'll get, if you sign up, you'll get emails, um, and you can learn about the project. Um, there are some high school students, I understand, and other people who have signed up because uh, they were very interested in it, but mostly it's otherwise scientists. So here is just the US, um, which is the biggest group um, of scientists in here, uh, over 660 members across quite a few institutes, um, hundreds of labs, over 650 uh, scientists who run labs have signed up, and 
this is the website for joining um, for any scientist who's, who's interested or anybody who's interested. And um, the, the way that this, so there, there have been many scientific, um, large scientific initiatives um, in, in many branches of science. The physicists are famous for this, for building these giant colliders with thousands of people. Um, in biology, the big example is the Human Genome Project. There were thousands of people working together to map the human genome for the first time, and um, they had to really work together, and they had to develop new ways of working together, because it's not easy for a thousand people to come together and work efficiently with each other. Um, since then, there have been other uh, similar projects. There's a cancer genome project to focus on just tumors and different types of cancer. And that also included hundreds of people. And now this is sort of a third generation one. And a lot of the lessons that we learned in the Human Genome Project and those other uh, large scale biology experiments um, have, have been worked into the design of the um, human cell atlas. So for instance, um, um, it's important, you know, and these are sort of the principles and values that are defined that everybody should be aligned with. So um, a lot of these things are standard in scientific projects, like obviously the data has to be very high quality, um, but one, you know, additional things are important, like we need to engage communities, different people, of different types of scientists that may never have really talked to each other very much because they didn't think their fields overlapped, but now you actually could talk to each other and work together and, and uh, to create some synergy. Um, it's important to be inclusive and to consider the diversity because we know that um, uh, uh, people are, there, there are a lot of differences between people and if we wanna map, create a human map, we need to map all of that. Um, and uh, very importantly, and one of the kind of newer things with this project compared to some other projects, Human Genome Project was very open, um, but um, not every project has been fully open, which means that all the data as it's being produced should be shared right away so that everybody can access it. And actually, um, one thing that, that uh, has been happening in the news recently is the coronavirus, and that's another project where people have uh, basically said we have to work together to solve this. So the only way to do that is everybody needs to share all the information right away, um, and, and so everybody can learn from what everyone else is doing, and that's a core principle of, of this project as well. Privacy and ethics are important. These are human subjects. We might be uh, mapping um, information across um, the lifespan of the human, so that involves information from, uh, like, you, you might get a blood test from a, 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 a child, for instance, and map um, the blood cells. Um, and so we obviously need to consider ethics, uh, and there's a lot of working groups around this. Privacy, of course, because it's genetic information. And then um, there's a lot of work on technological innovation to increase this new kind of microscope, the power of it. Um, and um, because it's generating so much data, there's a lot of computational analysis, uh, analysis required, like myself and, and Joe and, and, and other people here who, who uh, um, do scientific data analysis for a living who are responsible for kind of pulling on all the data and making, making sense of it. Um, so this project is uh, funded by a number of different groups. The NIH in particular is funding uh, a large project on mapping the brain. Um, there's now a human, um, uh, um, general human map project called HubMap. Um, there's one for cancer. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has been very generous. Uh, so these are the, the um, Chan Zuckerberg, or uh, Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook, and uh, most of his money was has now been put in a foundation, and they are funding a lot of scientific projects um, with his, uh, his partner, um, Priscilla Chan. And so they've, they've, they've decided this is one of their important projects. Um, we have um, projects in, in Toronto that are focused more on medicine that are also seeing this as an important project to help understand medical advances. So um, there's a lot of people coming together for this project, which is great. Um, so the, the idea is that the first draft might be 100 million cells, um, maybe most of the major tissues and systems in the body. Um, we uh, um, will only be looking at healthy individuals, um, not really disease, uh, both genders, geographic and ethnic diversity, and some age diversity, and then eventually a comprehensive at atlas would be, we would require information on billions and billions of cells. Um, all the tissues, all the age ranges, more geographic diversity, and so that's a, a, lo a long, um, a big goal that will take many, many years to, to um, solve. And eventually we 
have some kind of Google map of the body, and we could ask, you know, we can understand more about any of the parts of the body that, it, that, that we know about. So right now, a number of these projects are ongoing. So there's a skin atlas project and a kidney atlas project and um, uh, um, a gut atlas project, uh, lung, uh, um, de human development, um, and liver. So I'm actually going to talk about the liver project. So this is a project I'm very much involved in. Um, so the liver, um, um, I didn't know much about the liver before I joined this project. We don't normally think about the liver um, unless it, you have a problem with it. Um, it's doing its job, and, and it's actually one of the organs that um, does its job very well. But if there's a problem, then it suddenly fails, and then you have to have a liver transplant. Um, and, um, but the liver is, um, you know, so you know, we kind of know about the liver because um, uh, uh, you, you see it even on, in restaurants <laughs> from animals. Um, but uh, so, you know, kind of think it's like this, you know, it's this um, thing that's fairly uniform, but it actually has a lot of structure. So um, the liver's made up of, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what it does first. So the, um, the liver's sort of a metabolic and immune uh, center of the body. So people have cataloged over 500 functions. Uh, so um, drug breakdown, any kind of uh, chemical from outside of your body that comes into your body, the liver's job is to break that down and turn it and reduce, get rid of the toxic chemicals that come in. Um, it also uh, is responsible for a lot of the um, metabolism that runs our body and keeps our energy going. Um, it's a big immune center, so most of the macrophage cells, which are a type of immune cell in the body or in the liver, um, interestingly, it's one of the most regenerative organs. So you can take 80% of the liver away and it will grow back. Um, and so that's a very interesting property that we'd like to understand as well. And in terms of diseases, uh, there are two big diseases, viral hepatitis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that um, are affecting you know, almost 2 billion people worldwide. Um, viral hepatitis is, um, you know, these are very different geographically located diseases, but they affect a lot of people, and it's probably, um, uh, it, this is sort of a growing area of concern um, in, the med in the health field. So, so the liver is, um, you know, formed up of, formed of uh, these hexagonal blocks called lobules, and then there's a, a central vein and a uh, portal vein, and um, each one of these things sort, sort of, has a whole structure around taking blood from one to the other, and during this process, it kind of cleans the blood and adds nutrients and things like that. So the, there's a lot of plumbing in the liver that is responsible for kind of helping you digest food and taking in, um, in, for, taking in nutrients and providing nutrients and also cleaning it. So that's how it works. So I got involved with uh, researchers in Toronto. Um, Ian McGilvery is a liver transplant surgeon, and Sonia McParland is a liver immunologist. And um, these are, uh, Jeff and Brendan are people in my lab who helped with this project. And um, we, uh, when we heard about single cell genomics, um, we said, well, I was looking around in Toronto for people that we could connect with. And um, the, the liver transplant team in Toronto was very interested in combining our expertise in data analysis with the single cell genomics technology and liver, which is something they've been studying for a long time. So um, the, the way we get samples from the liver is um, from liver transplants. So Ian, when he does a liver transplant, uh, one of the things he has to do is he, he cuts off uh, a lobe of the liver called the um, caudate lobe. Um, it's the smallest lobe of the liver, and he does that normally so that he can get access to um, veins, that, like large veins, that are underneath uh, it so that he can um, put everything back together in a donor. Um, so, um, so normally, these, these pieces had previously just been considered extra parts from the surgery, but we can use them for, um, they represent healthy tissue from healthy donors um, that we can, we can look at. Um, so um, it took a long time. We, Sonia came up with this, um, big process for, how to, for figuring out how to get the cells out of the tissue. So I mentioned before that the first step of this process is once you have a tissue sample, you have to get the cells out. And the cells don't want to come out because they're holding onto each other. So um, it, uh, it takes a lot of biological under, uh, expertise to figure out how this works. And Sonia came up with this process, which I'm not going to go through in detail here. Um, actually, I actually have a video so um, that Sonia um, 
which is really great working with surgeons because surgeons uh, require a lot of, I'm, I'm gonna pause this, um, surgeons require a lot of um, uh, visual material to understand how uh, to share information. So they, 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 they draw a lot of pictures about how surgeries work with anatomy and they, they share that with their colleagues. So they actually have a, a team of people that can make great videos, for instance. Um, and um, okay, so, um, so the, um, Okay, I'll, I'll, before I, okay, I'll also tell you one more thing, which is a lot of the things that we tried to get the cells out of the liver didn't work. So the standard techniques, um, half the cells died. They're too sensitive. Uh, touching them the wrong way basically um, uh, uh, destroyed them. And so we had to find a very gentle way of getting these cells out so we can study them. Um, okay, so let's see if this is now going to go. So basically, um, once this caudate lobe is, is taken out, um, uh, Sonia figured out, okay, so here's the surgeon taking out the caudate lobe in a liver transplant surgery. And um, so the veins that are in here um, can be connected to, to tubes. And so one thing that you can do, uh, you can first of all clear out um, uh, blood that is um, in the liver. So here's the liver cells and here's the blood cells. So you can kind of wash that away, wash the blood away so that then you only have liver tissue left, not, not liver mixed with blood. And then you can put in solution that dissociates all the cells so that they let go of each other. And um, this is a collagenase enzyme um, and protease enzymes. And so, um, and the, the interesting thing um, about this caudate lobe is that it, it's wrapped in a, a sac, or the whole liver is wrapped in a sac called the glissens capsule. It's kind of, you can think of it like a plastic bag. So, um, and, you know, pu putting these solutions through the vasculature, that's like all the veins that, that go through the liver. It's a perfect delivery system because it's evolved to be the perfect delivery system for blood and everything else to get delivered into the, the tissue. So we can use the, 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 the veins and arteries to, um, the capillaries, et cetera, to um, uh, wash out blood, put these solutions in that uh, allow the cells to let go of each other. And all the while, that, all that, the while that's being done, the glissens capsule keeps everything together in basically a plastic bag. And when you're ready, you just open that plastic bag with a, a knife and all the cells come out and actually really minimize the, um, um, the um, amount of time that was needed and increase the sensitivity of the method. And so it was really ingenious from Sonia to, for Sonia to kind of come up with that. Um, and, um, and that allowed us to make the first map that we, that we, we made. So um, this is also kind of illustrates a whole bunch of data analysis steps, normalization, and um, various different types of visualization and filtering that we needed to get to get our final map. But at the end of it, um, we, um, we, we have our map. And um, 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 as, I, as I said, the, um, so I, before I show you what the map looks like, I want to just explain one more concept. So I told you before that previously um, genomics, before it was single cell, was kind of like looking at a, a smoothie um, like this. Um, and now with single cell genomics, we can kind of understand all the components, all the fruit. So um, one of the uh, typical ways that we used to visualize the information um, is called a Tisney plot um, with this complicated computer science name. Um, and so, but basically what it does is it organizes data points so that similar ones are together. And so it takes the fruit and it just pulls all the similar fruit together into a, a map. So now we can see that you know, we have, we can basically see much more clearly what we have. So before we had lots of different things and now we can see that there's five uh, um, types of fruit here. So our map it uses the same technology and we put all the cells together based on their similarity of their gene expression profiles. And, um, and what we found was that we, we found 20 cell populations in five healthy livers that we analyzed. And one uh, type of in, immune system cell was new that had not been previously recognized. Um, the interesting thing about that was that um, especially Ian and Sonia are very interested in uh, understanding uh, liver transplant um, and organ transplant in general. One of the big problems there, as many people probably know, is that sometimes a, a transplant uh, doesn't, um, uh, gets rejected. And then you might have to do another one. And obviously, uh, organs are very uh, precious and there's not enough of them. So 
what the, a big part of, a big goal of Sonia and Ian's research is to uh, figure out that process so you can reduce the rejection rate and also increase the number of uh, donor livers that are available. And identifying a new type of immune cell is really important for that because rejection is an immune process. So if you get an immune, if you get an, uh, if you get a, um, a, an organ donation, um, you, you have to suppress your immune system so that that organ can survive. Otherwise, your immune system will attack it as, some, as uh, you know, an, an other type of thing that it is, is uh, evolved to attack. So um, it's an immune process. New immune cells uh, give us a lot more insight. And in particular, this gave rise to a whole bunch of new ideas for Sonia and Ian to start thinking about and how they can modulate that process and, and um, control it so that it works better. Um, we now have funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to, uh, um, with, with actually about 19 other people across 10 different countries to map a lot of different types of liver samples in different ways, different ages. Um, we want to create a three-dimensional map so that eventually we can have a more spatial map, like a maps that we're, we're used to. Um, and we're developing a lot of interesting tools to, to analyze and share this data. How many people know it? This is the last little story that I'll tell. And it's just, um, it's not human, of course, but how many people know what this animal is? OK, a groundhog, OK, or, or, or a woodchuck. So I, I know they're not in Florida. It's probably because they got eaten by all the alligators or something. But um, there's a lot of them in, 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 uh, near where I live. Um, actually, my, um, my kids were in the back row earlier and, and uh, left because I guess they, they're young and they probably got bored pretty quickly. Um, they um, sometimes, like, you know, these things will come up and steal their food if they're in a picnic or something like that. So um, in any case, uh, these groundhogs or woodchucks are the best animal model of viral-induced liver cancer. So most liver cancers actually are caused by hepatitis B. Um, in humans, it takes 30 to 40 years to uh, develop uh, liver cancer. If you have this virus, if not everybody gets it, but it, if, if you are going to get liver cancer from this route, it will take this quite a long time. But in, in, um, in groundhogs, it only takes a few years. Um, they're the only other animal that we know of that gets infected by a hepatitis virus that causes liver cancer. And so the idea that hepatitis causes liver cancer was discovered and de was basically proven in this animal type um, because people could see how that was working. Um, there's no genome for this, um, so we have to sequence the genome. Um, the, the, liver, the colonies of these that have been studied for many years are in Ithaca and Cornell and in St. John's, Newfoundland. And so we're getting these samples from, from uh, Newfoundland. But basically, we're going to use this technology to study how liver cancer forms after, it, after these livers are infected with the hepatitis virus to hopefully learn more about it. So um, this technology doesn't have to be just human. It can be applied to any organism. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk to you about tonight. Um, just to mention the Human Cell Atlas Project is, uh, I mentioned as many people, I wanted to highlight the roles of Aviv Regev at the Broad Institute at, um, in Boston and Sarah Teichman at the Sanger Institute in, the, in Cambridge, UK. Um, they're the uh, chairs of the organizing committee and they kind of really spearheaded the uh, idea to gather lots of scientists together to work on this project and they, they really came up with the idea and they recruited a lot of other people. So right now the organizing committee has 29 people from 10 countries. As Joe mentioned, I'm on that organizing committee, so I'm trying to help um, develop it as much as I can, like many other people. Um, and so um, uh, um, a lot of people involved. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and, and that's all I want to, to, to tell you about today. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about anything I mentioned.